So uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second up-to-date on anterior viral uveitis. I hope all of you are keeping safe and healthy. And uh, as you all know that though we are not having our annual USI conference this year, we at UVI Society of India thought that this is the best way of imparting knowledge to each other. So we have a great panel of experts today who would be speaking and discussing anterior viral uveitis. At the outset, I would invite Dr. Bishari Gupta, president of USI, to open this session for today. Thank you, Manisha. As already mentioned by Manisha, these are up-to-date series. So we have lots and lots of time where you could ask questions. And we have two of the world authorities on uh, viral anterior uveitis. Sun Pek Chi from Singapore, who is extremely popular in India. And as she was saying, she gets invited almost every day for an Indian webinar. And of course, Manfred, you all know Manfred, he's the president of IUSG. And of course, all in India love Manfred and he loves viral anterior uveitis. So today you have all the time in the world to ask whatever questions you wish to. And without wasting time, we will move on to our speakers, Manisha. Thank you, ma'am. So just a brief introduction to all the panelists that we have today for the session. We have uh, Dr. Manfred, as Dr. Vishali has already introduced. He's from the University of Tübingen. He is also the editor of uh, Ocular Immunology and Inflammation, and he's a very known face uh, amongst our Indian circle. We also have Dr. Uh, professor Chi, who is a professor of clinical education in ophthalmology at the Duke National University of Singapore Medical School, and also a professor at the National University of Singapore. She is a senior consultant of Ocular Inflammation and Immunology Service at Singapore National Eye Center. She's worked extensively on VKH and on viral uveitis that we all are very much aware of. We also have on the panel, Dr. Somshila. She is a senior consultant of cornea and uveitis at LB Prasada Institute, Hyderabad. She's done her fellowship in ocular pathology from Dohini Eye Institute and has a keen interest in clinical research. We also have two experts, Dr. Reema Bansal, who is a senior consultant at PGI uh, Chandigarh. She's a discussant for an interesting case today. And also Dr. Kalpana Babu from the Vitala International Institute of Ophthalmology, Bangalore. So without much ado, let's start today's session. And I would invite Professor Chi, who would be speaking to us on clinical features to differentiate between HSV, HZV, and CMV viral anterior uveitis. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Manisha. So let me just start by sharing my screen and I hope you can see my screen up now. Is it visible? You can see my yes, screen? Yes. Okay, yes, great. Doctor. Thank you very much. So first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, UBIT Society of India for organizing this wonderful webinar and for inviting me to have a part in it. These are my financial disclosures with no relevance to my talk today. So we know that the herpes uh, viruses have a large family of members. There are actually eight members and all these can cause uveitis in the eye. But today we'll be focusing on herpes simplex 1, 2, herpes zoster, which is actually the third virus, and cytomegalovirus, which is actually human herpes virus 5. So when do we begin to suspect that a patient with anterior uveitis has a viral etiology? So typically, that would be a unilateral involvement, the presence of associated skin manifestations, um, especially if they're vesicular, uh, corneal changes, raised intraocular pressure, very important sign there. Uh, iris atrophy, another very characteristic sign. Pigmented keratic precipitates and poor response to corticosteroids alone. So there are three phenotypes. And um, the first one is granulomatous anterior uveitis with or without the presence of active keratitis. You may just see a scar sometimes. And usually we would start thinking of HSV1 and 2 or varicella zoster. Fossil schwarzman like syndrome and a Fox uveitis like syndrome are associated with CMV. So this is an acute recurrent kind of anterior uveitis associated with 
uh, ocular hypertension, that's Osner Schussman syndrome. And the chronic form is Fuchs Juventus syndrome, which has got the typical signs of diffuse, uh, uh, this diffuse fine keratic breastplates in the anterior segment. Um, and in the West, it's typically caused by rubella. And in the East, it's associated with cytomegalovirus. So the epidemiological factors for HSV and BZV, uh, these two viruses account for a large proportion of viral anterior uveitis in Western populations. And HSV and BZV have no gender or population predilection. However, in terms of the age, uh, HSV can affect any age, but it's more common in patients who are under 50 years old. Whereas VZV affects those who are older, above 60 years old, and also the immunocompromised. CMV anterior uveitis predominantly affects Asians, and they tend to be male. They have got two manifestations, either the uh, acute postnatal schussmann syndrome, which tends to affect patients from third decade onwards, and chronic CMV resembling Fuchs uveitis syndrome in the older population, fifth to seventh decade. So the, there are also epidemiological variations that exist in the pre prevalence of each virus. In Singapore, the commonest cause of hypertensive anterior uveitis is caused by cytomegalovirus. In southern India, Kalpana actually has reported that VZV actually accounts for two-thirds of viral anterior uveitis. And Elisabetta Masaruchi from Italy has reported that the predominant virus there is HSV. Uh, viral anterior uveitis tends to be unilateral Although HSV in uh, five out of one out of five may be actually bilateral, and CMV is something like seven percent may be bilateral, especially the chronic form. So the symptoms of HSV and VZV are very similar. They produce acute severe eye pain, redness, tearing, photophobia with blurring of vision, and if you ask them for it, or they may have pre uh, be presenting with some vesicular rashes at the time of uh, attack. For cytomegalovirus, there are the two forms. So the fossil Schussmann type would present with acute onset of halos, unilateral headache with mild blurring of vision, minimal eye redness, and they would give you a history of recurrent episodes that may have spontaneously resolved. The Fox uveitis type of chronic CMV and anterior uveitis typically would present with just blurring of vision, with minimal redness, and no floaters. And these patients may just come with a cataract. So because herpes viruses have a lifelong latency, they tend to reactivate and they may manifest as a recurrent disease. HSV is often acute in onset and then becomes recurrent. VZV again, acute in onset may become recurrent or but more commonly we see it as becoming chronic. CMV infection, as we said, for the acute recurrent form, it's actually in younger patients, less than 40 years old, and in the chronic form, it's those above 40 years old. So we're looking at the various features trying to differentiate amongst the viruses. It's important to ask for a history of dermal uh, manifestations. So VZV, we are all familiar with the vesicular rash that involves the dermatome of the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, like you see in this patient who also has Hutchinson's sign. And this rash uh, may be absent, but the patient may just have pain in that same dermatome. All right? So it's important also to ask for pain and where that pain uh, actually radiates to and involves. Now, be aware also that HSV has been reported to cause a dermatomal rash, which is very similar to zoster, so it's called zosteriform herpes simplex. For herpes simplex virus, typically they would have uh, skin involvement, like what you see here, group vesicles that occur at the eyelid border with diffuse ediba, and CMV has no skin manifestations. Now, the corneal involvement, typically in HSV VZV, involves epithelium and also cause, cause stromal keratitis, or more typically, when we see them presenting with anterior uveitis, they may just have corneal scars. Now, the dendritic ulcers, if they do have epithelial involvement, are different. We know that HSV is associated with well-developed terminal bulbs, and you can see the staining pattern is different. The uh, rose bengal staining is actually on the border for HSV, and the base staining with fluorescein. However, in VZV, they have pseudodendritic ulcers, which tend to be coarser. They don't have well-developed terminal bulbs, and actually you see fluorescein pooling at the borders. Well, if you look at these patients that present with uveitis and a corneal involvement, typically HSV would produce a, a patient with uveitis and disciform keratitis or interstitial keratitis, and VZV very commonly, we see numular keratitis and limbal keratitis. Now remember that these patients also can get reduced corneal sensitivity, and this may actually lead to neutrotrophic ulcers, 
especially HSV, VZV, but not CMV. So it's important to always check the corneal sensation, especially before checking for the intraoptic pressure. Uh, these patients may also have immune ring formation, and this may be associated with HSV, but also has been reported in CMV. And those delitis is more frequently associated with CMV, but also can be reported in HSV, VZV. So the absence of corneal involvement what you want to do is actually check for the endothelial cell count because a low cell count compared to the fellow eye actually often points to a CMV anterior uveitis. So let's have a look at some clinical features. All right, this is HSV on the left and VZV on the right. And these are all PCR proven cases. And you'll see that the corneal involvement here is different, right? You can see stromal keratitis, immune ring formation here. Uh, more commonly, we see interstitial keratitis or disciform keratitis, and here you see it with some scarring. And this is uh, not an infrequent way that these patients may present. And if you do not look carefully at the cornea, you might miss the scar here, which you actually would be telling you heaps. So now for the VZP, what we typically see would be these numular keratitis or limbal keratitis, but they can also cause endothelitis with corneal decompensation. And you can look at the shape of the pupil. This gives you a clue that this is viral in etiology. All right, because of the flattening of the iris here. And also you can get uh, patients who have got uh, nominal keratitis, multiple lesions here and with steroids. CMV typically you look for endothelitis and it can also affect patients who've had previous penetrating keratoplasty or a DSAC here, which just causes a lot of pigmentation, highly pigmented uh, type of KPs and corneal swelling. And this is the immune ring that I alluded to earlier. So the keratic repressive is a very interesting viral disease. The size and the distribution of KPs are very important clues. HSV, VZV, anterior uveitis tend to produce small to medium keratic precipitates, and they tend to be pigmented even though they're fresh KPs. Now the distribution varies, and uh, for HSV, VZV, they tend to be more in arts uh, triangle, especially HSV. The keratic precipitates in CMV associated with postnatal schwarzman syndrome tend to be very few, single, just medium to large, and very often they are just located in the center of the cornea or periphery. The chronic form of CMV tends to produce fine stellate keratic precipitates, just like folks with syndrome, and they are diffusely or uh, distributed but gray. In Western populations, these KPs tend to be brown, although the distribution is similar. There are some KPs that are characteristic of CMV and you want to watch out for them, so that you can recognize them. These are actually arranged in a ring, which we call coin-shaped lesions, or they can be nodular, nodular endothelial lesions that are surrounded by a translucent halo. So let's have a look at some clinical photos. So these are all PCR-proven HSV, and you look at the cluster of granulometers KPs of different sizes in arch triangle here. This is more diffuse, and you can see uh, some scars here and more of these KPs that they, they can be really quite diffuse, right? Uh, this is VZV. They tend to be definitely more diffuse than in HSV, and very often you can see they are pigmented as well. CMV is interesting. These are the characteristic lesions that we look for, nodular endothelial lesions. You can see the halo around the, the nodular lesion, and these may also be pigmented. These are the coin-like lesions, right? very fine KPs in a circle, all right? The postnatal Schwarzman syndrome, you can see sometimes just a single KP, or even linear KPs, or sometimes they're in the periphery, where you imagine they're just adjacent to the trabecular meshwork. Now you can uh, see rings of KP sometimes, right? So this doesn't really fit into a postnatal Schwarzman type, nor the chronic type that we're familiar with that looks like CM, uh, like the folks with syndrome. So these others are like the chronic ones that we described that are having diffused, these feathery KPs or just fine KPs, and these are pigmented KPs. Anterior chamber inflammation tends to be very mild with CMV, and they have very minimal flare, so they don't develop posterior sinic here. For HSV, VZV, they can have much more severe inflammation, especially VZV, and they can even come with hypopian formation like what you see in these two patients here. Um, focal iris stromal hemorrhage may be seen in acute HSV or VZV, although this is not very common. You may actually see a streak of hyphema uh, in the front of the eye there associated with this uh, hypopian. And um, not infrequently, when we tapped the eye for uh, analysis for PCR, we may even see 
AMSA sign or even at the time of surgery with decompression of the anterior chamber. This is what we often see in Fuchs Uveitis -Vale syndrome and also in CMV. All right, and this is because uh, the fragile iris vasculature is not supported because of the iris atrophy, so they bleed very easily. Um, iris atrophy in these three viruses that we're discussing today have got different patterns. And for HSV, uh, more commonly than VZV, we would see associated erodopletia during the acute phase. And typically, this would be a flattened kind of area in the pupil and poorly reactive to light in that particular portion. And this area subsequently after treatment would develop pigment epithelial atrophy and result in a transillumination defect. Uh, if you look at the pattern of iris atrophy years after that, a sector iris atrophy is more commonly seen and associated with HSV, but also seen in VZV. Spiral atrophy is less common, but is often associated with HSV. CMV infection causes stroma involvement, so this may be patchy or it may be diffuse, and very rarely, especially because this affects Asians mainly, uh, you may see transformation defects or even heterochromia. Pupil abnormalities uh, are not commonly seen in CMV because they don't have synechia, and so the pupil remains round. However, synechia may happen to occur in HSV and VZV, but not really that commonly, about 40%. And if this uh, does not develop, then the area of atrophy actually will result in a dilated eccentric pupil. So let's have a look at some interesting photos here. You'll see iridopletia and atrophy, and this is HSV, and you can see it occurring far more frequently than what we would pick it up with VZV. So you can see area of flattening, all right? So always look at the shape of the pupil, area of flattening and the typical kind of KPs in arch triangle, flattening here. And in this patient, when we track the patient over time, you can see this resulted in area of sector iris atrophy. And this is a patient who had an area of iris atrophy without posterior sinicare, and this resulted in a permanently dilated pupil, which was eccentric. Uh, this patient had repeated episodes of uh, HSV um, anterior uveitis and it was not recognized by her doctor, uh, his doctor, and he came from a different country. And every episode, he said, my light sensitivity increased. And we can understand why, because each time in an episode, you can adjacent area of a pigment epithelial loss and atrophy. So this causes a lot of glare for this patient. And this is a patient with a single episode of zoster. She had diffuse atrophy and I had to put in an artificial iris for her. And she also had a corneal decompensation, right? So it can be really a severe involvement of the anterior segment. This is a spiral atrophy that I mentioned earlier. So in the uh, CMV, you can see that uh, they can have iris atrophy, but this is stromal, okay? It does not affect the pigment epithelium. So you don't often get uh, transillumination defects. So you can see the iris becomes moth eaten in appearance and it can change in color, all right, with some depigmentation. This is a patient of PSS who developed diffuse um, iris stromal atrophy with repeated episodes. And sometimes you can see just a patchy area of iris atrophy. Now, the intraocular pressure is really typical of viral disease and it is seen in active prophetic anterior uveitis and is usually attributable to severity of trabeculitis. So if you look at the pressure, uh, the highest pressure recorded for the different viruses, you will notice that CMV typically has the highest uh, pressure, right? And in fact, 75% are more than 45 mmHg in the study that, that I published. And uh, the intraocular pressure in CMV tends to be out of proportion to the amount of anterior chamber inflammation. Whereas in HSV and VZV, it tends to correspond to the degree or severity of intraocular inflammation. RP tends to be persistently elevated if it is a chronic CMV, whereas it tends to be episodically elevated in HSV, VZV, or CMV-associated PSS unless it becomes recurrent and chronic over the years of uh, inappropriate treatment. RP tends to decrease after initiating anterior uh, uh, antiviral therapy if you get the patient early. Now, posterior segment findings are not common in the presence of anterior uveitis, but you may see spillover botrytis that is more commonly seen in uh, VZV involvement than HSV and is rare in CMV. Although we have reported some uh, signs in CMV uh, patients where we did angiography. So although each virus has its own distinctive features, clinical manifestations vary depending on the interplay between the active viral replication 
and the host inflammatory and immune reaction to viral antigens. The viral load and innate immunity of the eye, and thus the clinical presentation, may also be altered by medications such as topical steroids that may make the KPs actually change in character and even temporarily disappear. And the single virus can therefore present with a spectrum of clinical manifestations and the different viruses likewise may present similarly as such ocular manifestations may not be specific and the pattern of response is likely determined by the host genetic makeup and immune status of that particular eye. The manifestations of a single virus may evo evolve in the same eye over a period of time. So we have seen patients who initially present as post Schwarzman syndrome and with repeated and recurrent episodes, they progress on to develop chronic CMV as they get older, and then they develop persistently elevated LP. So in conclusion, a high index of suspicion is needed for a viral etiology in any case of hypertensive anterior uveitis or iris atrophy. Viral phenotypes include granulomatous anterior uveitis with or without corneal scars, postosomal like uveitis, and Fuchs uveitis uh, syndrome. As each virus has variable clinical manifestations, presentations, and different viruses may also have overlapping manifestations, the preferred method for confirming the etiology is to do aqueous sampling for specific diagnosis to facilitate optimal antiviral therapy. Thank you very much for listening. So thank you so much, Professor Chi. I think you have very beautifully described all the distinct features that we find in various virus infections. And I think, uh, uh, I'm sure you would agree with me that the clinical examination is the most important to be really reaching a diagnosis. And things like aqua sample PCR would be just confirming what we are suspecting clinically. What is your take on that? I agree, absolutely. So you need to know the features to look up for. And most of the time, we already know what virus is the likely cause of that particular manifestation. But for us in Singapore, because we have easy access to PCR analysis, that's what we tend to do for every patient. So that would definitely drive up the cost for our patients, but most of our patients agree. And we do explain to them that, you know, the dose of the treatment would actually vary depending on the virus and also how long we might be wanting to treat them for. So Dr. Manfred, I wanted a quick comment from you that do you also do a PCR sampling for all the cases suspected to have anterior viral uveitis? No, definitely not. Because I think in most cases, fortunately, uh, it will not change our uh, first impressions. Um, let me tell you first, I think we see different cases than Singapore says. Uh, I'm listening to Sun Faik's presentation since I don't know how many years, and it's always the same that you see a little bit different types of uh, viruses. So bilaterality, for example, is something we hardly see. And I'm still not convinced that we have bilateral um, viral-induced anterior uveitis. And I'm only convinced when I see a elevated type in both AC tabs. That's number one. We don't see them. Uh, number two is we hardly see these chronic CMV cases. Definitely not. We see um, Fuchs very, very clearly, probably a little bit differentiated to the one you've shown as CMV, CMV with Fuchs patterns, because our Fuchs are absolutely uniform. I saw a few of your CMV cases with your command, this is a Fuchs-like pattern. They have more, the pet, um, the distribution is all over, but there were some granulomatous in, so they have a little bit different uh, sizes. So that's something we rarely see, and we don't see these more chronic CMV cases, I think. Interesting. Yeah. So I just have a few questions coming up from the attend attendees, and the one question is from Dr. Ravinder saying that what kind of blood counts can be seen in VZV uveitis? I don't think that the blood counts would differ unless the patient is immunocompromised. So I don't think that would give you a clue that the patient may be having VZV involvement. And there's another yeah. question. Yeah, yeah. Can Dr. I add one more point? Um, of course, uh, you also would say that actually, if you have a uh, zoster patient with not 60, 70 years old, check for HIV. 
Otherwise, you simply get confused, yes? Do not look for serology, for virus serology, if you feel something anterior chamber related viral disease. This is complete, this is the best situation to get confused and to go to wrong direction. Agree. And uh, there's another question that, do you uh, assume that all poshnus kalsman cases, they are all presumed to have a viral etiology? Do we take that? Well, in our study, it was more than half that were positive. And we know that uh, sometimes we have to repeat the aqueous tap and like 9% actually had repeated taps before we got it positive. And I think, you know, uh, the more I think about all these cases, I think that poshnus kalsman Really, the manifestation is like an immune response because if you look at the viral load, it is really very low and the duration of which you can actually get a positive test is really very, very short-lived. So if the patient you know, says, I had it like two, three days ago, invariably it's negative. So I wish we had Goldman Whitmer coefficient with us because that would show us whether or not these patients that you know have got this uh, entity are more likely to be positive or GWC because you know many of our cases are negative even though they have typical symptoms. So it may be that you know we are getting false negatives because the viral uh, antigen is there only for a short period of time. So I think Can that I answers. Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. One more point uh, with a question to my Indian friends too. Um, one of the points is that our CMV positivity by far is not the one which we've heard from Sunfake and especially Baram Bodagi from Paris, he says it's 100% positive when we expect it. Um, we see probably 30, 40%. So there are a lot of things which I think are uh, false negative because these people later on uh, do not get, show, do not show any response to acyclovir, but to uh, then to anti-CMV therapy, therapy, they show very nice response. So that's probably one of the reasons we do not do in all of these patients immediately ACTAP for PCR. What is the situation about uh, sensitivity specificity of your uh, CMV tests in India? For us, for us, it's about 70%. And actually we get more CMV positive than HSV and VCV somehow. I don't know why. So our CMV positivity rate from the aqueous is higher. So Mshila, do you have anything to add on that? No, it's a lot of good points discussed. I thought that uh, I do have some slides which discuss a little bit about this in my in my talk. So Maybe some sure, more we can take more questions. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, so maybe we'll go ahead with our next talk by Dr. Somshila and then probably get back to the questions. So uh, Dr. Somshila, she'll be speaking to us on managing viral anterior uveitis, when and how. Thank you very much, Manisha. Uh, can you see my slides and am I audible? Yes. Yes. All right, thank you. So uh, as uh, Professor Chisun Fake said very nicely that this is our up-to-date webinar conducted by the UVA Society of India, and I'm very happy to be part of this. So I'm going to restrict my talk to when and how should we treat viral anterior uveitis. At the onset, I'd like to say that a large majority of my talk was made easy by just going through all the various publications by the previous speaker, and also uh, several other publications that are there which talk about it, including by Kalpana. So the job was very easy, but I have put in some thought into it and I'm going to discuss uh, as pertains to patients that we see at our center as well. So the first part is when you want to manage these patients as uh, Professor Zirhut mentioned and uh, Professor Chi mentioned that you must understand what is the clinical picture. So that is, has been wonderfully covered already by the previous speaker. So that is done. That's why it's three check marks for that. So now it comes to the actual management. So should we, uh, manage our patients guided by clinic. Clinically, the clinical characteristics, the entire symptomatology and the signs that we see and the clinical investigations that we do, or should we based, base our management principles on PCR? So you already got the answer to that. Professor Zero said that he hardly ever needs to do a tap to, to manage the patients, maybe for study or whatever other reason he might do it, or maybe in recalcitrant cases, but a clinical guided therapy is the number one way to go. I think almost everybody agrees. 
but there are certain situations in which a PCR would really help. And then we also have, we'll just quickly go through some recalcitrant cases, how do you manage them? And in special situations, how do you manage them? In fact, the picture that you see accompanying the slide is actually a five-year-old boy who presented with a hypopion anterioritis. And we did everything possible, tried to rule out retinoblastoma and many other entities. And ultimately from the uh, anterior chamber aqueous staff, we got uh, real-time PCR positive for HSV with a very high copy load. And this child responded to antiviral agents. So sometimes you can have special situations where there's a rare presentation of a known entity. So uh, we, uh, the previous speakers and in the discussion, they just talked about what happens in these viral diseases. So it's basically the eye, the uniqueness of the anterior chamber in the eye. So we, of course, are a natural reservoir for viruses. The human body is a reservoir for all sorts of viruses and including it can be in the blood, which can then go into the eye. These viruses can lie dormant for years. And in fact, that is the situation with some of the viral anterior inflammation is that they can sh keep shedding intermittently into the anterior chamber. But the host response is based on factors which could be age, which, which could be prior disease. Uh, that's why you see the difference in the spectrum for the young patient versus the elderly, older patient. So then the infection, when it occurs in the eye, that is, that is when the viruses start shedding into the aqueous chamber. We in, because of AK, we hardly have any inflammatory cells, innate inflammation, inflammatory cells to take care of these viruses. Therefore, we, there has to be an immune response generated when there's a breakthrough. And it's this immune response that is going to now help in neutralizing these viruses. That is why you will see that there is a slow. That's why, as Professor G mentioned, that as soon as you do a tap, the golden Whitmer coefficient won't be positive. It takes a short while because antibodies have to be produced and it is positive in chronic diseases. So some total of what you see in the eye is probably due to the cytopathic effect of the viruses itself, which is love, for example, CMV loves the conyl endothelium and so on. And also the host response, the immune mediated host response. But in spite of all that, we know that when we treat the patient with antivirus and despite a robust therapeutic, therapeutic regimen, maybe more than 80% patients can have recurrent episodes of disease in their life. And in fact, uh, although Professor Zerhit has not seen those patients, we have seen patients where disease persists for years together. I, we have patients of 16 years, 15 years duration, harboring the disease in the eye, and we keep treating them, they keep coming back with recurrence. So this is another uh, table which is very useful in Professor, Professor Chi and Professor E. Player's article, which talks about aqua sampling, for these three viruses, basically HSV, VCV, and CMV. And what you can have here is oral acyclovir or valacyclovir. If the uveitis, if the uveitis responds, then you can continue on one of these drugs in a maintenance dose. And if it doesn't, then you have to think of something else. In the case of aqueous, in the case of CMV positivity, you can have two presentations. It can be an acute inflammation, as was described, or it can be chronic, where there could be glaucomatous changes, where there could be endothelial cell counts dropping. If it is acute, it's, if it's very mild, very infrequent, and everything else is healthy, you may observe these cases, and in, if, but keep a close watch. And in case they worsen, then you go ahead and use aggressive therapy. In the case of chronic uveitis, uh, although Dr. Chi, this table mentions that you can use gansaclovid gel and of course the other medications, but the, the experience that we had is that in case of chronic disease, the topical therapy doesn't seem to work and we end up using systemic therapy. So I'm going to come to that in a little bit more detail. Just wanted to document that there are also some rare viruses that seem to cause antiviruses, which are mentioned and which were published in earlier literature. So we really don't know what to do for these viruses. So it's quite possible sometimes when our patient doesn't respond to any therapy, maybe he or she is harboring one of these viruses in the eye. So again, coming back to a little bit of basics, I'll try to spend as little time as possible coming to the mechanism of action of acyclovir and val cyclovir. So you know that acyclovir and val acyclovir, which is a product, basically work because the virus has thymidine kinase. So in a long story short is that the thymidine kinase helps the drug to get converted into a com compound, which will then uh, cause, which will then interact with the, H with the DNA polymerase enzymes of HSV and prevent the viral synthesis. So that's what happens with acyclovir or valacyclovir. Sidofirid works a little bit lower 
on in the same pathway. It doesn't need thymidine kinase, and foscarnit just directly acts on the DNA polymerase and prevents viral synthesis. So the end stage is that all of these drugs act by preventing viral synthesis. Gancyclovir, what it does is that you uh, it the uh, it works on CMV infected cell even better. It also works on HSV. Here, by the uh, CMV has this, this particular gene, which is UL97, which helps the gancyclovir to get converted to an active molecule. And that's how it works on the viral DNA polymerase of the CMV infected cell and knocks off the replication of the virus. So that's why uh, acyclovir will not work for CMV. So this is the mechanism that needs to happen for CMV. So coming to the specifics of the therapy itself, uh, we talked a little bit about PCR. That's why I put this slide here. I thought people would ask about uh, systemic uh, testing and viral serology. So my take on that is, of course, IgG is not useful at all because most of us would have uh, it's, uh, some amount of uh, IgG antibodies present to all of these viruses. IgM positivity, although it cannot be correlated directly to ocular disease, but in some cases it can tell us that the patient has an active systemic disease. For example, if there's a high IgM positivity for systemic CME. So it's, I'm not really sure whether we can use serological testing to diagnose the ocular disease. I'll just put this here because this was a question at a previous webinar that we had. Coming to goldmer Whitmer coefficient, it's already been mentioned that it, it measures the intraocular antibody. So it's very, very useful because the viral particle itself can be transient in the aqueous. It can just last for a few hours, whereas the antibodies can persist for a much longer time. And therefore, in chronic disease, this particular test would be extremely useful. It's considered positive if the value is over three. And of course, the last, but probably the very important test we have is PCR testing both qualitative PCR as well as quantitative PCR, it would be good to do both if we have access to that. But the better way to do it is do a real-time quantitative PCR because it will tell us the presence and uh, what is the viral load, what are the copies of the virus present in the aqueous. What we have at many testing facilities, I believe, is a quantitative PCR is available for VZV, whereas real-time qualitative PCR is available for HSV1, HSV2, and CMV. So these are the viruses that we can test most of the time in our patients uh, by doing a multiplex PCR. So coming to the meat of my talk, that is what should you give to the patients? For HSV anti-UVHS, most of us, I think this is a very intuitive kind of therapy because we deal with viral keratitis as well. So the, the dosaging is not really very different. You start the patient as an adult patient, 400 milligrams five times a day, or you can use valley cyclovit, which is a little bit more expensive. Uh, initial loading therapy could be for three weeks, uh, and followed by that, you can step it down. For example, if you're using acyclovit, you use 400 milligrams twice a day as maintenance. You need to do a baseline renal function test. This, this is an extremely safe drug, but still, and then repeat every six months, especially in the older patient. We do have pediatric patients also who come in with this disease, and here the dose is 30 milligrams per kg. You divide this into five doses, and you, you have this particular medication available as a liquid preparation, uh, which needs to be uh, measured properly and given to the child. So this is what you need to continue for three to six months at least. I'm just saying three to six months. It may be longer actually. So minimum therapy would be three months. Uh, we probably tend to use it for six months and watch the patient for recurrences. And if there are recurrences, you have to start the patient again on this treatment. So what about the other medications? Of course, there is usually quite intense inflammation as was described earlier. So you need to use topical steroids and the, you need to do a very slow taper of these steroids. Sometimes you may want to switch to low dose steroids or topical NSAIDs and maintain the patient. You have to find the soft spot with which the patient doesn't get redness in the eye and maintain the patient on that particular dose uh, once a day or once an alternate day even sometimes for the next several months. Cyclophagics, uh, in very severe inflammation, I tend to use atropine, but in the other cases, we can use homatropine. Topical acyclovir doesn't have much role really, but for the, for the if you want to be follow the textbook or be purist about it, then if you use prednisolone eight times a day, then you ideally have to use a topical acyclovir to prevent the epithelial form of the disease. But I am guessing that many of us are no longer using this for viral anti-UVHS. 
So of course, uh, several patients would have raised pressure. So you need to use anti-glaucoma medication. That is based on the assessment, the degree of glaucomatous damage and so on, and avoid PT analogia. And in case the patient is now stabilized and needs a cataract surgery, so make sure the patient is on prophylaxis. What happens when we feel that the patient is non-responsive or the patient, we have HSV, clinically it looks like HSV, there's some keratitis or some other clinical features that point in towards HSV itself or PCR is positive, but the patient is not improving. So this could be that the patient, uh, the, the particular virus is uh, resistant to asacrovir or valisacrovir, in which case you can increase the dose. Either you can increase the oral dose to the zoster kind of dose, that is 800 milligrams, five times a day as I mentioned, or you can give high dose intravenous acyclovir. Uh, sometimes that might help you, but sometimes it might fail again. So you can use intravenous foscovir, but this is very expensive for us, which is, I don't have any personal experience, and also intravenous sidofovir. So the second and third are very expensive and uh, not very easily available for us. So what I would do in so-called non-responsive cases is step up to twice the dose for that particular patient, uh, maybe use intravenous acyclovir in very rare, maybe in a, in a very rare situation. Uh, if not, I might just switch the patient to valgancyclovir. So the treatment for VZV anterior uveitis, in my mind, is pretty similar to uh, what we use for HSV anterior uveitis, except that the dosing is, as you know, uh, 800 milligrams five times a day, so it's double the dose but pretty much everything else is pretty similar to what you have in HSV. There is some role uh, that has been mentioned and I was trying to read the literature and there's no consensus on the role of vaccine. As you know, that there's a vaccine for VZV, uh, there are two forms of it actually. And uh, uh, well, there li there's literature saying that it might be protective and the literature saying that it might induce uh, viral anterior VHS. So I really don't know and I have no experience of using the vaccine uh, anywhere in the therapy for VZV anterior uveitis. So again, very slow taper of steroids. Just because the patient gets an inflammation doesn't mean that the, the virus has reactivated. It's usually immune mediated. So sometimes we need to use a low dose of steroids for a very long time, monitoring the inter intraocular pressures. Uh, these patients are usually older. So very often they come in for cataract surgery. And again, you might need to use some prophylaxis or careful observation for these patients during that period. Coming to the last virus, but the, the, the one that sort of like interests me or excites me the most and the toughest to deal with is CMV endothelitis. I must say that all my interest in CMV was given this talk so many times that every time she gives it, I get so interested in this virus. So the treatment for CMV antiviratus in a nutshell is oral band gancyclovir. Uh, what we use is 900 milligrams twice a day. So this is available easily to us as a tablet of 450 milligrams. So each tablet is 450 milligrams. You need to use 900 milligrams twice a day. That is four tablets in the day. Uh, it would be great if you can use that for six weeks. That is probably the appropriate uh, length or duration that we should use it for. And then we step it down to half that dose. That means 450 milligrams twice a day for another six weeks or more is what I've written over here because you don't really know that this much of therapy is going to abolish future recurrences. It's quite possible the patient might still have recurrences. In fact, there was a publication, a fairly recent one, where they had uh, used this therapy for an average of 20 months in about 11 patients of CMV antiviratus. Luckily, the patients didn't have, didn't have any side effects. So what else then? Uh, it, intravitreal has been described uh, which is given as a weekly dose for three months. They have never used it for anti uveitis Topical gancyclovir gel has been described. We have also used it. So you use it five times a day for three months. Uh, can be used sort of an augmentation with a gancyclovir implant. Uh, now that's not available to us, I think. And also you can use intravitreal gancyclovir followed by oral val gancyclovir in order to reduce the dose of oral val gancyclovir for these patients. So a little bit, we should know about the side effects. Uh, Valgancyclovir, unlike acyclovir, has a sort of a more uh, serious side effect profile. It can cause multiple minor side effects like diarrhea, constipation, unsteadiness of gait, etc. There can be mood changes also, watch out for that. 
but the more important part is that it can cause low WBCs and low RBC counts, low platelets also. It can cause like a pancytopenia, which can affect uh, based on where you read it from one into one, to, which can affect one in 100 to one in 1000 people that you use it in. It can cause lymphopenias and sometimes it can be very severe. So there can be an adverse reaction and you can have severe lymphopenia leading to sepsis. So you have to be very careful about that. And a very rare side effect is sort of a permanent or more severe bone marrow suppression, which is uh, which can happen. And as I said, that some patients there have been reports of hallucin hallucinations and some other side effects like that, and renal side effects as well. So before starting Valgan cyclovir, make sure that we get the complete blood counts, the renal function test, and warn the patient about all these uh, likely side effects that the patient may have. So is it worthwhile then if there are so many side effects? I think it is worthwhile because when you look at the corneal endothelium of this particular patient who has CMV uh, antiuretics for years, uh, if you don't treat this patient, then, then you're just going to lose the cornea. You'll have to end up doing a surgery for that and the disease might recur once again. The only sad part is the treatment cost. So as I said that we use loading dose twice a day for six weeks and I'm maintaining the dose again for six weeks. So each tablet, and this is in Indian rupees, the, the cheapest that we can try to get costs about 350 rupees, which means that the total therapy for a patient, if I'm using six weeks plus six weeks, is about 90,000, which is uh, easily four to five months salary for an average uh, Indian uh, person. So it's four to five months take home for an average Indian. So that is a huge amount of money. But some, some, but some patients can afford, uh, can afford it, but uh, many of our patients cannot. So that brings us to what do you do when patients cannot afford it. This is one of our very interesting cases, which is CMV uh, uh, from PCR also. We got very high viral load and the patient improved. This was the patient who had the disease for 16 years and the patient improved dramatically after we started the patient on therapy. So, so what can we do when the patient cannot afford or, or maybe or has side effects uh, or has very infrequent episodes. In that case, we can use uh, topical gancyclovir gel. I also know that there's a 1% and a 2% ointment uh, not available to us, but it's available in other countries. Uh, remember that when you use uh, topical steroids for CMV, it's better to use, you don't need to use prednisolone acetate very frequently. In fact, it is counterproductive, I feel, in some cases. So you can use it in less frequent dose and you can switch it off more rapidly and switch the patient to lower uh, steroids. And of course, you need anti glaucoma therapy. When you monitor these patients, as they come serially for follow-up, look at the IOP, and of course, look for specular counts on every follow-up. Due to lack of time, I'm not showing you cases. I have so many patients where you think that the patient is doing well, but you actually see that the, uh, there seems to be very mild inflammation, but you actually see that every visit the specular count is going down. So another chart for you. So when you clinically suspect CMV endothelitis, uh, if you have facility for PCR testing, you can do PCR analysis. If not, with all the clinical features that was mentioned earlier, you can make a clinical diagnosis. And if the patient, you're able to convince the patient to take the treatment and start the treatment, you can definitely start that. Ideally, it would be great to repeat the PCR at the end of this therapy and see if the viral copies have gone down significantly, in which case you can just use a topical maintenance therapy. Some of these patients will have persistent coronal edema, which may not recover, in which case they may need to undergo surgery. And when you have to do any surgery for them, again, you'll have to start them on prophylactic doses. So these are some of the articles that I looked through for this particular talk. Uh, thank you once again to UBI to Society of India for giving me this fabulous opportunity. Thank you, Somshila. I think you've again very extensively covered the entire management. So are there any comments from Dr. Manfred or from Dr. Chi? Anything you would like to add to it? And thank you, Anastad. Okay, Anything? then I go on. Yes. Uh, it's really very why do you Why do you give the treatment for six months of systemic acyclovir. I think there are quite good studies from the Americans who show the effectiveness of one year treatment. That exactly responds to my experience that one year treatment systemically is really effective. Once in a while I try to stop it before and we see recurrences. After one year I have a wonderful 
um, basic situation that recurrences are not so often seen, definitely, the systemic treatment. And yeah. one more point, I, I do not really understand why not having the same dosage for HSV as for VZV. We also start with five times 800. I think it's very safe. Um, the first point, I do agree with you. Most of the patients that we treat, we keep them on treatment for at least one year, the prophylactic treatment for one year. So this is, uh, that's, that was a regimen, we have not published it also. But when you go through published literature, it recommends that you, you institute it for three months to six months. And that's why I made a point over there saying that you might have to give it longer because at six, six months again, the patient can come back with recurrence. So Sheila, uh, what would be your maintenance dose for sake of audience? So for HSV anterior images, it is 400 milligrams twice a day, unless they have recurrences even on that, in which case I step up. Yeah. Okay. Um, one more comment to recurrences. When I no on non-responsiveness, I think this could be HSV and it's not proven and I see no good response. It's highly suggestive for me for CMV, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So the second question you had also said, Dr. Uh, Zehert, is about uh, why not give the same dose, 800 milligrams five times a day, whether it's HSV or VZV. I think it's, uh, I don't know the correct answer to that, but if you look at the uh, recommended dose as per body weight, so when you calculate for the average Indian patient, 400 milligrams twice a day seems to work. And we've been using that for years. So I, that's an open question if anybody else would like to answer that. I think the major problem is less uveitis, it's keratouveitis. So if you really are in a hurry that you have some kind of uh, keratitic, uh, stromal, whatever infiltration, you want to have the best, the quickest treatment. In that regard, I really would recommend to have the highest dose possible. And that's the reason why such patients with um, keratitis tending to the center, I love to treat actually for a year. Yeah, our keratitis patients, yes, we have them on treatment for one year or two years, or some of them even five years now. So are we suggesting that the maintenance dose has to continue for at least one year to avoid a recurrence? I do. I do it. So I don't Soon fake, let's soon fake reply. Yeah, so I normally give it for three months and if it doesn't come back, then that's it. But if it recurs the next time, it if goes it recurs, to one year. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I wanted to say recurrent, yes. yes. So that means initially we will continue it for three months and wait how it behaves and then we decide for the longer maintenance? Yeah. If it recurs, then it's no longer three months, then you got it. And so fake, what would be your maintenance dose for topical steroids in a recurrent patient? Yeah, so for topical steroids, I would do the same like what has been described, you know, I mean, during the acute phase, it's really intensive inflammation. So the prep fault would be really very, very high frequency. And then I would be, we're talking about VZV and HSV, that would be very, very, very gradually tapered when the dose and frequency is reduced. So, you know, they can be on twice a day for like three, six months, yeah. and then it will go down again once a day. And, you know, they're so steroid sensitive that I will do even like once a week because I've tried sometimes yeah. stopping even with that once a week and they will relapse. That's yeah, right. once in three days. Yeah, once. Yes. It sounds yes. crazy, but it works. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and is there any role of NSAIDs? I mean, uh, people are concerned that you'll be using NSAIDs for three to six months because there's always a risk of a corneal melt in these cases. I don't use topical NSAIDs for HSV or VZV. I only use it for CMV. So that, that's surprising. I, I don't use it either, but all the publications that I quoted actually mention it. So I'm a little surprised, but personally, uh, I'd rather use a low dose steroid than use an NSAID. I think that's the purpose of up to date so that we can come up with something that we recommend in practice. Yeah. Can I talk about the pressure? I think uh, I use the steroids mostly to reduce the pressure. And I don't think so that NSAIDs would really reduce the pressure in the same amount as steroids, definitely. I yeah, do not right. have steroids for long term. If the pressure, one more point, the inflammation in our viral induced uveitis cases is 
minimal to low. We hardly see three, I've never seen three plus cells. I hardly see two plus cells, something like this. The, you have to be aware, active uveitis is always that you have cells or infiltration somewhere, but in viral uveitis, it's increased pressure. So when I see half a plus AC cell with 30 pressure, this is active viral anterior uveitis. I think this is very, very important. And then you have to react. Do not expect a lot of cells. I think, Sumfaik, that's a little bit similar to your situation too. You do not see a lot of cells. Not for CMV. But, you know, I showed you two eyes with hypopian. Okay, with yeah. And yeah. Uh, for VZV, it's terrible sometimes. I mean, it, But they that, respond nice to treatment normally, yes? Uh, not always. Yeah. I would say that, oh, okay. uh, Professor Dr. Veshali, to answer your question about uh, what should be correct, what should what should be recommend. So, one very important factor to take into observation is the du duration, the chronicity of the disease, mm -hmm. and whether the patient ha already has other complications such as corneal involvement and secondary glaucoma, the extent of the glaucoma. So, for example, if the patient has corneal involvement, secondary glaucoma, I would continue. Say it's herpes. I would continue with prophylaxis literally for a very long time. Now, I'm not going to be able to tell you how long, but till, you know, the patient, till is totally symptom-free and everything is resolved. So it would be one year, it could be more than a year. Whereas if the patient comes in just initially with a milder version of the disease, uh, it's a first episode. So that could even be three months or six months therapy that I mentioned earlier. About steroids, similarly, HSV and VZV, I feel need higher dose. And CMV, it's not really the steroids, but the antiviral, that is virocidal, which will help us actually. So you don't need a very high dose of steroids in a very long duration. Or, or maybe you do, I don't know the correct answer, but certainly you don't need a very high dose of steroids in these eyes, but it's more the antiviral. Whereas so because it's virus, virostatic for HSV and BZV, it's only virostatic. And that's the reason there's just low, there's shedding of viruses, shedding of viruses, and there's an immune reaction set up. And that's why you keep on, you need to suppress the virus with antivirus, and you need to suppress inflammation with even one drop a week, as you said, of steroids, something like that. And I comment quickly to the side effects of Valgan cyclovir, which you presented. These were patients which were only treated with Valgan cyclovir, or in addition with hundreds of HIV uh, treatments. I'm very so, surprised about these side effects. We've never seen any of these side yeah, effects, yeah. at least Germans in such a strong. amount. Germans are strong. <laughs> no, we, we do not have only German patients, come on. We, we also have uh, problems with viruses, I tell you. <laughs> we do, the patients do complain of the gastrointestinal side effects. And I've had a couple of patients complain of mood changes. And I was surprised and I couldn't attribute to the, to the drug till I read about it and apparently it causes that. And although they have overemphasized about the lymphopenia, uh, luckily uh, we have not so far seen that in a significant way in any of our patients. So it's a safe drug, but I wouldn't be very nonchalant about using it without being uh, more uh, vigorous about uh, making sure that the patient doesn't have any side effects. So I'd rather be on the, it, you know, it should be on my radar of side effects to look out for it. But we I've also seen patients with neutropenia. I have patients with neutropenia. And that's why yeah. it's scary for us. So our yeah, exactly. doctors, ID doctors, would do their blood tests every two weeks. And the dose has to be stepped down. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they have no treatment they can actually, you know, that's effective that they can be given. So it's a problem for us. Because we, we have can have cases, Manisha. Yeah, so uh, ma'am, I'll just quickly take up two more questions. One is that how do you differentiate between a recurrence of the primary viral episode and an immune-mediated reaction? Because that's going to warrant that do you really want to step up your antivirals or step up your steroids? PCR. I would so, not recommend that, sorry. We had one patient which were positive CMV we treated him adequate, we stopped treatment, then he flared up like hell with pressure problems and things like that. The next PCR was negative. So we restarted treatment and he became successful again. So in, at least in our hands, the PCR is not that safe uh, to prove anything, definitely not. So when the pressure is high, 
this is a sign that there is an immune effect in addition. And you will never treat only the immune effect. You also will treat uh, antiviral plus uh, anti-inflammatory. So since Dr. If there is a reference, we give both steroid and antiviral. Is that the message? Yeah. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Okay. This is quite common in HIV, I think, the way you're describing, where initially the PCR is positive and subsequently the PCR doesn't come positive, but there's a lot of reaction. That's the reason why I cannot support to follow PCR as a uh, regimen for your treatment. It, it doesn't work for us. It may work for some other uh, patients which have CMV in a higher concentration. That may be a problem, yes. So I'm very inquisitive to ask Dr. Cheet, since she's been strongly recommending a PCR, are there any special tips or uh, you know something special that she does when she's collecting the sample? Because it's not so, so you know, reliable in our hands or it's not so positive in our hands. So is there any specific things when you do before you collect the sample? Um, not really, because it's a DNA virus. So you can leave it lying around overnight before you send it to the lab. Sometimes we do have cases that you know we tap in the evening. And uh, what we do is we send it for both real-time as well as qualitative. And very often, our results would correspond, right? Well, if one is positive, the other is also positive. So that you know, I know that it's real. We've hardly had discordant readings. So Dr. Manfred, just a quick question I'll take up is that uh, some, uh, Dr. Shahana actually highlighted this, that if you are having a much higher inflammation in the eye, it would be associated with much higher inflammation of the ciliary body, which will actually result in a decrease in the aqueous production. So do we, do we interpret that when the pressures are low, does that mean that the inflammation is much higher or severe? Do you see any correlation between the two? No, that's not so easy. I think you have to check the cells. You have to check the pressure. And then you can start. Uh, in my experience, to reduce the inflammation is easier uh, than reducing the pressure. So sometimes, again, you see a decrease of from 2 plus to hardly any cells, but the pressure still is 30. And that creates some real problems in these situations. I think there is not a simple relation, definitely not. Soon fake, what do you think about this? Um, I agree, but every time the patient has a pressure that seems to be uncontrolled, I always tap. And uh, most times, you're right, it's a very high titan. Yeah, that's when it doesn't come down. So before the glaucoma doctor gets you know at them, I will do the tap first. So and then, you know, and then I will treat. And you know, very often in, within twenty four hours, the pressure comes down to just a little above normal, and then it will get back to normal. So I don't like my colleagues to put a tube in because you know these patients may actually have very low pressures thereafter for a long time. What about the role of topical gencyclovir? For CMV, actually, you know, it seems to work for us. And actually, the 2% that we use is eye drop, not ointment. And it's uh, constituted in our pharmacy for us. So we use the intravenous form and we dilute it to the 2%. And you can see that in, uh, I think, there's a Taiwanese population by, um, publication by Dr. Su. Um, and we, we use that all the time. The only problem with that, that eye drop is that because we are formulating it ourselves, the patients have to go around with the thermos plus and they put it in ice so that it's kept chill. And it's you know given like two hourly for the first one month and then we drop it to three hourly and then to four times a day as it get better. And we, we do that whenever we find that the gel doesn't work before we switch to oral. So we find that when we use the 2%, most patients would be saved from you know paying out so much money for the oral. And some patients even, you know, we will tell them, use your gel five times in between, right, with the two early eye drops. And that seems to work for most patients unless there's some, you know, reason for immunocompromise, like some of them have got thymoma and the thymus is removed or some other reason for that. Yeah. Good. I've learned something. We don't Great. have it. <laughs> you can make it. I think we'll move on. Select. 
Somshila, while the case is going on, can you please type this for everybody's benefit? The last part of Sunpik's eye drops. I'll do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we'll move on to the case presentation now. The first case is by Dr. Sayali. She's from LB Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad. And this case is going to be moderated by Dr. Kalpana Babu. Dr. Sayali, you can start your screen sharing. Hello. Uh, are the slides visible? Not yet, Sally. You have to double click. We are seeing you, but not your slides. We're, it says you've started screen. Yeah, now you're on. Oh. Just put a full screen and then you'll be fine. Yes, sir, you're on. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. I'll be presenting a rare presentation of sequential HSV keratoubitis and epithelial microsporidiosis. The case is of a 27-year-old female who came to our clinic with redness and visual blurring in the left eye for three weeks. She was immunocompetent without any history of trauma or contact lens. Her visual acuity at presentation was 20 by 60. Her slit lamp examination revealed oval epithelial lesions, uh, which stained variably with fluorescein. And the corresponding ASOCT showed epithelial hyperreflectivity. At this time, the patient was on steroid antibiotic com uh, combination, morfluorin D, homatropine eye drops three times. So we uh, scraped all the uh, lesions and performed gram and uh, uh, calcofloor white staining for this patient. So gram staining revealed multiple oval non-budding gram positive microsporidial spores as seen in this picture. Uh, while on fluorescence microscopy, uh, small oval spores of microsporidia were seen. We started the patient on topical antibiotics and asked her to review after 10 days. On the 12th day, uh, she presented with a drastic drop in visual equity to 20 by 400. The epithelial regions had resolved, but uh, at this visit, she had stromal edema with DM folds and large pigmented KPs, which only spared a bit of the superior cornea. This is a slit section through the large pigmented KPs. This is the corresponding ASOCT, which shows a uh, elliptical uh, endothelial keratic precipitates. The pachymetry was 704 microns. At this visit, we performed an AC tap for her, which was negative for uh, VZV, HSV, CMV, as well as microsporidia. We performed a, a HIV and VDRL testing for her, which was negative, as well as a baseline text X-ray, which was negative. Uh, we started her on a uh, oral acyclovir five times a day, 400 milligrams, as well as uh, Predfort eye drops six times a day and called her after 10 days. So as we can see on day 22, the AC inflammation had resolved, the corneal edema had reduced and the uh, KPs have like resolved with pigmentation. This is the corresponding ASOCT. We can see the same here, the corneal edema has resolved and these are resolving KPs. And the visual acuity had also improved to 2030. We continued tapering doses of steroids, and after three weeks, we switched her to uh, BD acyclovir. This is the picture four months later. Her visual acuity had improved to 2020, but she showed numular subepithelial lesions at this visit, as we can see here. Uh, we continued the uh, we uh, gave the patient topical lubricants at this visit only. And this is the follow-up after seven months. As we can see that the numular lesions are resolving. And this is the ASOCT, which has shown complete resolution of the edema as well as the KPs and the inflammation. 
This is her specular examination, which was done at the seventh month. In the left eye, there is a little drop in the specular with the endothelial mosaic slightly appearing affected as compared to the right eye. So my questions for the panel are, uh, is, was this an immune mediated endothelitis or was there active infection with HSV? And uh, what is your experience with TAP negative anterior uveitis treated with antivirals? Thank you. Thank you, Sayali, for such an interesting case. And before we start out, I, I would just like to ask you, what was the intraocular pressure recorded on the 12th day? It was 15 no, mmHg, Dr. Kampana. Pressures were not very high. No. They okay. were 15 by uh, Goldman Applanation Tonometry. Now, um, so basically what Dr. Sayali has presented is an interesting case of ocular microsporidiosis. And as we all know, ocular microsporidiosis is one of the most important differential diag you know, diagnoses is viral uh, keratitis. And many times we mistake that and treat it with acyclovir. Now, the interesting part is this is a patient who has developed uh, infection and this is microbiologically proven. And within 12 days, she develops a uveitis, I mean, something like a stromal edema with uveitis as well as keratic precipitates. So something like an endothelitis, which she has developed. Now, uh, and you have ruled out other systemic causes as well. And, you know, in, so let's look at it. This is a patient with a microbiologically proven infection, uh, not viral, which is microsporidiosis. And eventually on day 12, develops an immunological reaction or something like an endothelitis. Now, uh, this period is uh, normally you expect immunological reactions to occur over two weeks. Now, when we see a patient with endothelitis, like for example, in this case, there are different possibilities we need to think of. One, the infection itself, whether uh, you know, the immunological mediators which are triggered are responsible for the endoth endothelitis. And at the same time, the drugs which you're using, because the epithelium is not intact, is it worsening your endothelial pump mechanism because of which the fluid is more? And the third thing is sometimes you can have an immunological reaction, which is uh, non-infectious idiopathic inflammations which can occur, which can also cause endothelitis. But the interesting part is all of them respond to steroids. But what is interesting is one of the most important differential whenever we see endothelitis is to rule out a viral infection. And uh, the most common in our patient population will be one cytomegalovirus. And if you look at Western literature, it is um, herpes simplex, which can cause. Apart from this, you have other viruses as what Dr. Chi had mentioned in her talk, like HL, you know, human herpetic virus 7, 8, all these can cause when there is already a decrease or the, you know, the uh, immunological, the environment is altered. So there are many things which are playing a role here. Now, as what Dr. Chi and uh, Dr. Somshila had mentioned earlier, like looking for subtle clinical features, in this particular case, except for the stromal edema, we didn't see any other corneal involvement, which you would normally see in, um, uh, you know, herpes simplex. Probably one thing which you could look at is any reduced corneal sensations, which this patient would have had. And again, for this amount of inflammation, I would have expected the eye pressures to be on the higher side, which is not there in this particular. Again, there could be some difference in the pressure recording because of your pachymetry. The corneal uh, thickness was quite huge. So that is one thing which uh, probably we need to keep in mind, whether it is an actual uh, IOP, which you have checked. And you have... Um, and probably a confocal, which Dr. Chi had mentioned, you know, looking at owl-like lesions on the endothelium, that is something which could have helped you in uh, saying whether this is CMV or is there a possibility of a viral. From what I understand and read up in the literature, again, uh, imaging markers for HSV are relatively low. I mean, they're all non-specific findings which you actually have. And it's difficult to pinpoint whether that is related to HSV or not. But again, uh, considering the way this whole, uh, you know, you have already a microbiological thing, probably what I would have done different is treated this patient with steroids first. And if things did not improve or she was developing any corneal lesions, then maybe I would have started her own um, antivirals. 
Now, again, if it is CMV, again, the choice of viral is wrong. Uh, it would have done better with gancyclovir. Or, so my understanding is what you're looking at is probably a herpes simplex viral, you know, something related to HSV. Now, regarding your second question, uh, uh, which is PCR related, again, uh, our speakers have already mentioned the wide range of sensitivity and specificity, which we have seen in our own practice itself, as well as in the literature, which is available. But what is important is the positivity of P PCR is much higher if you have an IOP, IOP spike. And, uh, and if you also see pigmented keratic precipitates, then definitely the, uh, uh, the chance of you getting a positive PCR is much higher. Second thing is, I feel it also depends on your lab. Again, the, uh, you know, what is your limit of detection for that particular virus in your lab? That, because many of these studies in the literature which is there, they are varying because the limit of sensitivity, again, detection is different for each and every viruses. So that is something which we need to keep in mind when we are analyzing the PCR report. And as what Dr. Chi had said, uh, even the viral load, it could have been for a transient period and probably we didn't pick up at that point of time. But so again, and we haven't tested for other viruses. We have just tested for those which we can treat. And uh, you know, uh, those have come out negative. So these are some things which we need to keep in mind when we say a PCR test is negative, it doesn't totally rule out viral. But in the situation which probably you are in right now, maybe the way the whole thing has progressed, I would probably first treat with topical steroids and the antibiotics. Watch him or watch her for a small a period, you know, closely observe. And if things didn't get better, then probably I would have added antivirals. This is my take on this particular case, but very interesting. Case. Yeah, Dr. Gunjan apparently has raised this question that if you are scraping for microsporiodosis, uh, that itself could have led to an anterior uveitis. Uh, apparently, there are some reports in literature. Uh, so what is everybody's take on that? And I agree, because any corneal procedures, which include even you know, these kind of minor procedures, as even many, many times they also do the linking as well. And uh, they do a PRK as well, therapeutic. And these can increase endothelitis or it can increase uveitis as well. So uh, again, there are many things which play uh, uh, an important role because the immunological response which it itself induces adds on to the existing uh, thing. Probably Somshila can... Uh, yeah, I, you're a yeah, I agreed. I also answered that yes, we do see anti-uveitis but typically low grade. We also see some KPs. Here the case was very different because of the very severe coronal edema. The patient's vision dropped down and the cornea was so thickened, as you could see. So that, um, it's really difficult to understand if just because you, and the epithelial lesions are very gently scraped off. It's not like thinking. So we gently scrape off the lesions and having such an aggressive corneal edema was very unusual. So as you very nicely uh, put together all the points, Kalpana, even we are not very sure which of these diseases we are dealing with. Dr. Manfred or Dr. Chi, any comment from your side? Yeah, so no. can I just ask, you know, because this patient was treated for quite some time with just topical steroids, and do you think that could have allowed the microsporidia to actually penetrate into the stroma, and then later, you know, manifest in this way far more aggressively than what you would normally see? Because I wouldn't give, you know, these patients a lot of topical steroids without the antibiotic cover. Patient was not on, uh, I don't know, Sally can answer that. Patient Was the patient on topical steroids for a long time? Uh, she was for uh, about 10 days, Dr. S's, before she presented to us. She was on morfluorin D three times. Which is a lower dose, very low dose of topical steroid, not a potential, not a high potential topical steroid. Dr. Mm -hmm. Manfred, there are want reports of uh, uveitis which have been described with ocular microsporidiosis. Dr. Manfred, you wanted now, to add? Yeah, quickly. What is the time difference between scraping and the appearance of endothelial precipitates? 10 days, Doctor. 10 days. I think that's too much for a foreign body uh, induced HSV uveitis. I think there was a limit of two or three days. 10 days seems to be too many, too long. So I would not believe in this one. 
Did you see AC cells? One plus cells in AC. Plus. So I think this is not HSV uveitis. I don't think so. It's a very, very mild uh, additional um, feature of microsporidial uh, keratitis. And I think the precipitates were not typical in any way for HSV yeah. uh, or CMV. This was far too uh, soon fake. What do you think? Do you see no. these like the CMV? I don't no, think so. Definitely not. They look weird. <laughs> Well, that's a good could response they, to steroids. Could it be just a part of microsporidiasis? Yeah. So we just blame, I suspect. We yeah. blame only one, uh, one culprit here, that's microsporidia for everything. I think even the scars <laughs> which you're seeing also, uh, you see it in microsporidial uh, infection. So, yeah. You know, we have a difference between endothelial precipitates and endotheliitis. Uh, for me, endotheliitis is some kind of active endothelial inflammation. And for me, the classical and the only existing end of time end, endotheliitis is HSV, VZV, and especially CMV. The other ones are simply mechanical, ALS triangle, something like that. So that's so important to differentiate between ALS triangle, which normally ends up in the basis at six o'clock. You should see precipitates until six o'clock. This is a proof for me of some kind of uveitis. And I see this extremely rarely in HSV or VZV, only in very severe cases. Normally I see endotheliitis, which is more in the center, not reaching the limbus. And that's for me a big difference between uh, the gentle, typical HSV, VZV, uh, inflammation uh, and other types and other of uveitis. I think CMV we do see in peripheral also. We but have cases minimal. Yeah. CMV is very minimal. Yes. Minimal. Yeah. Should we move on, Manisha? Yeah. Uh, just a quick question: that any specific antibiotic that you prefer for uh, microsporidia? The answer is no. <laughs> just a wide any wide spectrum. Antibiotic that you will start? I think you do give oral albendazole, right? I, at least one, two patients which we have, we do give albendazole as well. So. Okay, so we move on to our next case presentation, and that's by Dr. Gazal Patnaik. She's a UVR fellow from Shankar Netrale, Chennai, and her case is going to be moderated by Dr. Reema Bansal. Uh, am I visible now? Yeah, very much. Just do a full screen, please. Yes. Good evening, everyone. I'm a UVI and Medical Retina Fellow of Shankar Netrale, and today I will be presenting a very challenging case of viral anterior uveitis, challenging both uh, with respect to its manifestations, disease course, and the management. So a 42-year-old male, diabetic since four years, came with a history of on and off redness and dryness since four years. And he has been treated with anti-glaucoma medications, systemic anti-glaucoma medications as well, on and off for secondary glaucoma. At presentation to us, he had a, a vision of 6-6 six, six in both the eyes and AC was quiet with few large keratic precipitates. And uh, uh, as so basing on this, and the IOP was very high. So, basing on this, uh, anterior viral uveitis because of viruses uh, was high on the list, and we went ahead with a PCR analysis of the aqueous humor. In the meanwhile, we saw a diffuse stromal iris atrophy, as can be seen here, due to perseverance of the posterior pigment epithelium, and there were coin shaped uh, keratic precipitates located centrally which is not uh, which are only small fine keratic precipitate distributed in a ring shaped pattern as has already been described meanwhile the pcr report came and it was positive for cnv virus with 660 copies hence the patient was treated with oral valgancyclovir 900 mg bd dose with topicals and anti glaucoma medications two months post this 
uh, again a repeat PCR was done which came out to be negative and valganciography thereon was tapered down to 450 milligram VD along with institution of the topical gansigel eye ointment. Then two months later on, that is four months from the initial visit, the anterior chamber inflammation subsided fully with only few keratic precipitate imprints that can be seen here. At this time, PCR was again uh, repeated from the aqueous humor, which revealed negative for the virus, the CMV virus with no copies. So, Gansigel was continued along with the antilocoma medication. However, in three months' time of no antivirals, that is seven months from the initial visit, again the patient presented with a AC reaction and a increase in the diffuse stromal iris atrophy and increase in the number of keratic precipitates. At this time, the intraocular pressure was also raised, but the patient has stopped the antiglaucoma medication three weeks ago. So at this time, because of the financial constraints, uh, PCR could not be repeated and so the patient was treated with systemic and intensive uh, topical corticosteroids. However, in two months of time also, the patient did not respond and the IOP was still high apart from systemic as well as topical antiglaucoma medication at the range of 40 to 42 millimeter of mercury and there were mild AC reaction. At this time, we could repeat the PCR from aqueous humor, which came out to be highly positive with 42,000 copies of the CMV viruses. So at that time, we reinstituted instituted gancyclovir at the dose of 900 milligram VD and gancigel was continued. And in seven months, the anterior segment inflammation as well as the IOP could be controlled and then the valgancyclovir was stopped and gancigel along with the antiglaucoma medication was continued. However, in around eight months, the patient again developed AC reaction with high intraocular pressure when he was already on three antiglaucoma medications. So, without doing any PCR, we reconstituted valgancyclovir along with the systemic corticosteroid. This was the third round of the antivirals. In a one month uh, of antivirals, the patient underwent phaco IOL under steroid and antiviral cover in the left eye. And at that time, perioperative aqueous humor PCR was done, which came out to be negative for all the viruses. And in the five months gap interval, the right eye also underwent phaco trap. Trap was considered in this uh, eye because of the visual field changes noticed, that is, inferior nasal defects with 0.6 to 0.7 cup disc ratio in the right eye. But no antiviral cover was given at this time. And we could uh, do the PCR from the trabecular meshwork tissue, which came out negative for all the viruses. In two months at last, the patient maintained the vision and the IOP could be maintained at 16 mm of mercury with only single anti-glaucoma medication. And finally, there was no inflammation without any antiviral cover. So our case is very well fitted with a bilateral chronic anterior uveitis. Though bilateral cases are reported very rarely in around 7% as has been highlighted earlier. But how does a CMV anterior uveitis presents in an immunocompetent versus an immunosuppressed uh, individual? As we all know that immunological component is very much prevalent in cases of CMV anterior uveitis. So diabetes mellitus as such should be considered as an immunosuppressed state or not and how to proceed in these conditions. Also, the geographical disparity is very much documented, especially in the Asian population. Secondly, CMV anterior uveitis is, is associated with vision loss due to glaucomatous disc changes. So, at this, uh, with this, uh, the, it has been recommended to do institute the antivirals. But are antivirals recommended only for the glaucomatous change without the presence of active inflammatory reactions going on? Because, uh, and what are the role of antiglaucoma medications, the timing of the surgery? Because as we can see in our patient, the patient, uh, we were not able to control the intraocular pressure and it was only after the surgery done that uh, the anti medication could be tapered down to only one single uh, eye drop. So another is what are the preparatory measures for the surgery? Like what should be uh, the timing of the antivirals, the dosage, and whether the antiviral cover is needed preoperatively and in which case it's not needed. 
and we all know that cmv antibody shares various subtle changes from other viruses but they do have various overlapping phenotypic expression with other anti uh, with other viral viruses like herpes viruses so what are the role and utility of pcr because they do have a higher specificity and positive predictive value of nearly 90% but sensitivity is around 43% as uh, reported in our recent literature however in our patient the pcr was negative and in 2 months uh, the when the pcr was repeated there was a very high viral load then uh, another thing which concerns with the cmv antiretrovirus is the recurrences it is associated with many recurrences and it has to be it is attributed to the fact that cmv viruses could develop an immune evasive mechanism per se and ocular tissues are also found apart from the systemic ganglion involvement ocular tissues also do have latent cmv viruses in ciliary body and the iris tissue so uh, what is the role of gancigel in this regards because uh, gancigel in few reports have shown uh, higher concentration at the iris tissue level so these are my points of discussion thank you So, thank you, Gazal. Am I audible? Yeah, Doctor Rima. Can you hear me? Yeah, just just maybe a little louder, please. Hello. Thank you, Gazal. Thank you, ma'am. So, uh, your case uh, nicely uh, summarized and shown all the details. Now, I think one thing that the case revol revol revolves around is the multiple pcrs that you did and every time we get carried away by the positive result now to begin with if i may ask you you said the visual acuity of the patient was 66 and the iop was high so we really don't know what was the reading of the iop from your case so anyways did you think of any other etiology before you just went on to do a pcr for this because the presentation was not very classical it was a bilateral anterior uveitis going on for 4 years now i think we would have most of the questions answered by dr chi here how does cmv chronic uveitis if at all it is cmv chronic uveitis for 4 years would we have these kind of changes or would we have more do we expect the iris to be more moth eaten rather than having a stromal the trophy or you know which is more in favor of a herpetic virus and what is the relevance of the repeated positive cmv dna from these uh, pcrs of this patient because initially you said there were 600 copies and then repeat pcr after treatment was 42000 copies yeah so first we have to know the relevance of false positive cmv dna because i don't think we investigated this case for anything else maybe we didn't have to but there are a lot of things that are revolving around this and uh, before we move forward to the treatment how to manage uh, the recurrences and the surgery and you are lucky that your case did very well after a phaco trap because as per what dr chi said these cases are the last ones to be operated for a filtration surgery by and large they do well with a combination of anti glaucoma medications and all so your day case ultimately did very well but we still have lots of unanswered questions so before we discuss further can we have dr chi's opinion on the presentation of this case as bilateral for four years with multiple positive pcrs and do we really have to do pcr at so many visits Okay, so I I think this is a very interesting case, and Manfred has his wish fulfilled in seeing a bilateral viral uveitis being presented at this webinar for your discussion as well. But this is not uncommon for us, uh, especially you know to me a diabetic is immunocompromised. There's no doubt in my mind. Okay. Um, so it's not so uncommon to see patients uh, present like a Posner Schwarzman syndrome, which is what he is presenting more like than the chronic CMV uveitis. 
um, you know, the thing about this patient was that he was treated not just with um, um, antiviral, but he was given oral steroids. Now, I've never given oral steroids because to me, that would immunocompromise him further. And that probably explained why the viral load shot up to 42,000. If he had just been given some topical steroids, uh, maybe he wouldn't have had such a high viral load, you know, when, when he had a recurrence. And I've seen actually patients who are given topical steroids, some even in the past, you know, they, they were not recognized as CMV because that's before the time we knew about CMV in the anterior segment. They've been given subconjunctival dexamethasone because they had inflammation that was raging on. And I've also had patients, you know, like um, year 2002, you know, they will be referred to me because they had been having this inflammation in both eyes. It never responded. And their referring doctor from the, the private sector had been given them immunosuppression co-managed with the oncologist. And, you know, I remember that patient, the, the doctor was horrified because after that, you know, the, the patient's uh, creatinine climbed, the liver function was all deranged because the patient was on methotrexate plus cyclosporin and the inflammation did not seem to abate. And so that patient was referred to, to me and that time I looked at the patient, one eye had decompensated, okay? The cornea had decompensated and I referred to my cornea colleague for a transplant and the other eye was a little like a postnatal Schwarzman syndrome still. So it was like so strange, but you know, this patient actually, when I, I said, you know, I don't know what you have. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop everything. And I'm just going to see what the original manifestation of this disease was. And actually he got better. So to me, straight away, it meant that this was likely to be infectious. And when I started to see CMV in some eyes, I went back and I tapped him and true enough, he was positive in both eyes. But because he had been given all this immunosuppression, we saw evolution of the disease because he had a history of postnatal Schwarzman syndrome and low endothelial cell count. So that time it was called uh, postnatal. Uh, he was called having glaucoma. He was on Timolol, and then he was told he had Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. Okay, but actually this is all tied in together, you know, by one disease, CMV in both eyes. And because of all the immunosuppression, he evolved from a postnatal Schwarzman to the chronic CMV, which I alluded to earlier. And then he developed the endothelitis and he went for a transplant in one eye. You know, and, and of course, this, this poor gentleman has had repeated uh, endothelial keratoplasties in that, that same eye that had a penetrating keratoplasty in those years. So I think that um, I would be very, very worried about giving oral steroids because it also is not warranted because the inflammation is very, very minimal in these cases. They, as I said, they don't have much protein leakage. If you measure the flare, and I've measured the flare in many of these patients, because to me, it supported more a CMV if the flare was very low. So you don't really get sinicare and so on. So I don't even think that the inflammation is that high that it warrants you know, so much topical steroids even to even consider giving oral steroids. So really, I think that probably this patient had, you know, his ups and downs because he was given antiviral together with the oral steroids. And I would avoid even giving intensive topical steroids in these patients because I've seen patients just with that, you know, many years of just intensive topical steroids, their viral load goes up really very high in the eye. So CMV is something that we have difficulty treating and patients who have just had topical steroids alone without oral steroids, you know, because they were not diagnosed to have CMV in the eye. I treat these patients as immunocompromised and I would treat them with um, oral uh, antivirals. Okay, most of the time, if I've got anterior uveitis, I treat them with topical. But if I have a patient who has had topical steroids year after year, that patient has an immunocompromised eye and therefore that patient responds better to oral uh, uh, antivirals, okay? And even with the antivirals, I, I had a patient from the UK who's actually a doctor who came to work in Singapore. He's Indian, by the way, okay? And he was diagnosed just as an inflammatory uveitis and given steroids. So when he saw me, I straight away knew the diagnosis. And, you know, he's had such a stormy, you know, cause, clinical cause, because even with the oral antiviral, he would get better 
And the moment you stopped it, it would just immediately relapse. And I think it was because of the many years of just having pure topical steroids without recognition of this, this entity. So I think in this patient, if he's diabetic already, I'll be very, very worried about him because he's immunocompromised. Okay, and, and I, I generally don't feel the need for oral steroids in this condition. And uh, even if you're going to do surgery, most of the time, I just tell them to continue on the topical antivirals and try to withdraw the topical steroids as soon as possible, and they do fine. So I, I don't usually get them relapsing. I would only consider giving oral antiviral if the patient has had an endothelitis, because I think the endothelitis is a true infection because the viral load in these patients with endothelitis is really very high. And when you treat them with antiviral, it practically becomes zero and they rarely recur. So I think, you know, it, it's, that, that's why I said that. I think PSS is a lot of it is immune response. You know, these are young patients with very strong immune response to just a small viral load and they, they limit the infection very rapidly. When you get older and older, these patients have lowered immunity. You know, we know about aging of the, uh, the immune system. And so these uh, conditions become chronic. And these patients actually, sometimes they really need the oral antivirals to actually get everything under control. But when you think of the endothelitis, this is a true infection, which if you treat once appropriately, right? If it's not a delayed treatment, they actually get a cure and they don't get recurrence. So I think in this case, why we saw our up and down, you know, and high viral titus is because the patient was given oral steroids, which really, uh, I don't think is really necessary in my experience. So, uh, I'm just going to uh, add one. In our cases where, I, you know, in the middle, you had seen a few patients, I mean, few pigmented KPs, which were not there earlier. I feel this is very important, especially in patients with CMV, because when you uh, normally they clear very well unless they have an endothelial involvement. And the minute you see even one single pigmented KP, I think you should really start uh, topical antivirals. That's what we Agreed. do. We burnt our fingers quite a bit, you know, kind of trying to ignore that and then waiting for it to become full blown. So now whenever we see even a, you know, one or two pigmented KPs, which were not there earlier, we immediately start, um, I mean, Valgan cyclovir gel along with uh, topical mm -hmm. steroids. Yeah, I agree. Is, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and can yeah. I make a few comments to this one? Um, the bilaterality is rare, absolutely. I think I've never seen something like that. I have to go to Asia to see that probably. <laughs> Please but, come to um, Singapore. We're waiting for you. This is unfair, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Without Corona, we would have just finished a beautiful uh, meeting. So let's stop that. Um, number one is I would never give steroids in such situations without antivirals. Never, ever. The when I, is a problem. When I uh, treat these patients, it's always a little bit more. Uh, we also use topical antivirus, to be honest. And I think you do not use them because the Americans suggest to you, you don't need them because they don't have them. So I think they are really effective to use these things, especially if you have a touch of keratitis. It's nice. But um, always a little always bit touch more of more antivirals than uh, steroids. Some point, what is immunosuppressive or immunoincompetent? We are not talking about HIV patients, I think. We are talking about a situation which is similar to ARN, acute retinal necrosis. I'm very sure there is something that the immune competence against virus is a little bit changed. Sorry, we do not know anything about this one. And probably if we can look for these things more into detail, then we can also analyze our patients for such kind of immune defect or something like that. It's especially against viruses. And um, I think that's something we also have to keep in mind with on. Next point, surgery. I would definitely not suggest to do any surgery, intraocular surgery, without uh, especially antivirus in addition. And the 
even when we do not see such patients. This reflects exactly my patients with VKA, sorry, CMV, uh, which have long lasting disease and they flare up whenever we stop our systemic treatment. It's a disaster. So our responses after three months are a disaster. We always said to come back. Uh, Sunfake, did you report about a patient, sorry, a doctor coming from UK having yes. CMV uveitis? Yes. So let me add as a final comment that at least 70% of my CMV and tear uveitis patients are doctors of medicine. Mark? So that's very open, often. Dr. Vishali, you'd like to say something? No, I just want to know why doctors. <laughs> Probably it's infection. It's infection. I had one pediatrics and he said, well, I was treating CMV infected kids. Definitely, infected. yes. Okay. So they more or less know where the infection could be the well the source has been something source like that one. Difficult. But Dr. Manfred, we all have a high zero prevalence in in, yeah. in in our part of the world. So in CMV? No, not here. CMV we do have Asian population, we do have a high zero prevalence. Mm. We not, definitely not. Well, it's These related all... to your social economic group, you know, level as well as uh, crowding, social crowding. Yeah. Yeah, so now it should drop because we're social distancing. Yes. And the other one, which is not a doctor of medicine, is a priest from Africa. <laughs> Definitely. Very clear, beautiful responding to uh, our systemic treatment. So, Manfred, I have a question for you. You know, you said that your patients, they could not come off their antivirals at three months. Were these patients diagnosed immediately on presentation? Or were they those that were delayed? And then finally, when they came to see you, you said, aha, you are CMV. I think most of them were delayed. So I that's think so. the reason why. Because they have had People... so much topical steroids. As I said, Probably. anyone like this Good. would be called an immunocompromised eye. And these patients, I would just give them oral. So we I can think the take-home a... message is, go ahead, Manfred. No, we can make a top 10 of misdiagnosis. Number one is forever folks, but number two is CMV probably, and there are some other ones. We should work on that one. And then probably also make some more education in that regard. It's a disaster for the patients, yes? We have both eyes blind in Fuchs uveitis. Can you imagine that one? It's a disaster. So I think uh, before we wind up, what we learned from this case is if you have an immunocompromised situation with CMV, obviously do not give oral steroids, just treat with topical steroids and start with oral antivirals, right, Dr. Chi? Because your conventional treatment is, yes. as you say, that what you give is 2% uh, eye drops. Yes. If not responding, then 0.15% gel. And the, other way. the other way around. 0.15 is more than you. 0.15 and then gel. And then if not responding, then the oral. 2%, yeah, and then the oral. If you have a patient presenting with an underlying condition like diabetes, you straight away go with oral treatment, right? Yes. Or if the patient is delayed in presentation and has had a lot of topical steroids, that patient should also go for oral. And as you said, avoid surgery. But, but in any case, if the patient has to undergo surgery, what prophylaxis do you give for CMD? Well... Unlike Manfred, um, I just give topical. Uh, if the patient is a patient who's been responding to topical and is not immunocompromised, and these patients, as soon as you can, you withdraw the topical steroids um, so that they do not have it, you know, intensively. And uh, these patients do well. In fact, I find that, you know, glaucoma uh, surgery actually is good for them. They do not scar up, unlike, you know, other inflammatory uveitis because they have such a low flare. So these, these uh, I, I mean, I've done, you know, the times like maybe like 25 years ago when I was doing uh, trabeculectomies, I've got patients whose flaps are still functioning. And I, you know, I, I saved the eye because by the time I saw the patient, the cup, this was 0.9. Until this day, the flap is still functioning. 
So I'm not really worried about bringing these patients to surgery in that sense because they will do badly, but I just want to caution you against unnecessary surgery because the pressure may be up because you have not treated the patient with the antiviral that he needs at this time. So, you know, these patients actually do pretty well. And the only thing is that once you have done the glaucoma surgery, they no longer have the symptom of the high pressure, the halos and, you know, the discomfort in their eye because the pressure goes up in maybe 30 instead of 50. So the patient does not know he's having an episode. So sometimes it can become a little dangerous if he's still having episodes. So we still need to keep an eye on these patients and you know you, you can't think of them as being cured because the, the glaucoma is not apparent anymore. And you need to really quite closely monitor the visual field and in addition, the endothelial cell count, which is an excellent surrogate marker for an ongoing infection. Thank you, Dr. Chi. And thank you, Our, it's quite similar because the number of patients who are going in for a glaucoma surgery with CMV uh, who are well controlled with antivirals are much, much lower than the ones with HSV or BZV, HSV especially. And these guys have done extremely well so far. So I, we agree it's the same in South India as well. So I'll just take up one last question which has been posted is that if a patient undergoes a penetrating keratoplasty, and has a history of a viral uveitis in the past, what would be the kind of profile access again that you would like to give before the surgery? And if there is a recurrence after the PK, then how would you really change your management for the same? Okay, maybe I can answer that. Um, you know, we were seeing patients, say after cataract surgery that had a posterior capsule rupture come in at three months with a decompensated cornea. And of course, at that time, the corneal surgeon said, oh, you know, this is a botched, botched job. So, you know, it's botched up. So that's why the cornea decompensated so early. But having knowledge of CMV, we then began to look at the photos, all right, before the cornea really hazed up because photos would be taken immediately after surgery and in, in between. And we actually found that many of these eyes, you could actually see the keratic precipitates that are typical of CMV. So in these eyes, actually, I think you should really tap these patients before you bring them to surgery because many of these may be presenting as a decompensated cornea. Actually, the cause is CMV. And if you do diagnose CMV, you know, before your surgery, please treat them with oral antiviral and see if they respond. Because we have had patients that were thought to be really needing transplant actually had everything reversed. Okay, so you want to tap them, and if they're positive, you treat them first, right? And you might be surprised, you may not need the, the transplant. And if you still need it, because the cornea endothelium has decompensated to the extent that there are no more endothelial cells left, you can bring them to surgery. Please try not to do a PK if you can avoid it. You know, today we're doing DMAX. Uh, for some of these patients, and they, they do pretty well, right? They, you, you have less problems with the immune response. But at the time of surgery, also you can tap them. And then I would normally cover these patients one week before the transplant with the oral prophylactic dose and continue as long as they are on intensive topical steroids. Once you have reduced the frequency of topical steroids for the graft, that's the time you can actually uh, stop the uh, prophylactic oral cover. Thank you, Dr. G. I think that answers the question very well. Yeah, very well. Uh, any other comments before I just summarize the entire session? Dr. Vishali? No, you can go ahead, please. So, uh, thank you so much. And I would just uh, briefly summarize what have been the important learnings from the session today. I think the, uh, without any doubt, everybody has to say is that the clinical signs in viral anterior uveitis are the most important and help us in the diagnosis. The PCR, of course, if performed, helps us in confirming our clinical diagnosis. A long-term maintenance therapy is extremely important and should really uh, be continuing at least for a year to avoid any kind of a recurrence. And there should be a very gradual taper of the steroids. However, we should never think of starting steroids uh, without an antiviral cover. That's extremely important because it can really flare up. 
And if you have a patient who has a raised intraocular pressure, so we have to believe that it's secondary to the inflammation that's happening in the eye. So if we control the inflammation, that automatically is going to help to a large extent in controlling the intraocular pressure and the surgery should be the last resort in such cases. I think these are the important learnings. And as Dr. Chi mentioned, endo endothelitis is something which is important where oral antivirals need to be considered uh, in the first go. Any immunocompromised patient, again, oral antivirals play an important role. So I think this is what has been the major learnings from the session today. If anybody wants to add anything, I would be very happy. Dr. Manfred, anything from your side? It was very nicely summarized. Thank you. Fine. Thank so thank you. Thank you so much. I would uh, really like to thank each one of you, all the panelists, Dr. Chi, Dr. Manfred, Dr. Kalpna, Dr. Rima, and both our young fellows who presented such beautiful cases, Dr. Ghazal and Dr. Sayali, and Dr. Somshila and Dr. Vishali. Thank you so much, all of you, and Hallmark Events for having organized this webinar so well today. I hope it's been a great learning for all of us. Have Thank a safe you. Day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks Have so week. much. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Great session. Have Thank a you. nice weekend. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.